I'll dwell into my presentation immediately. Uh, okay, um, as I have uh, army background, uh, we you know, if you look at the Sanzu, what he said that if you don't if you don't know your enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. I think that's one of the purposes of today, where we are trying to learn things. Uh, sequence of presentation, there's a brief profile of myself, then the project background, which I'm going to discuss today. What exactly the IoT is, then I'll talk about the case study, and then the security philosophy of mine. I'm going straight deep. Uh, I'm in security business from last 30 years, and when I look at the security, how the people approach it, I feel it, they try to tend use technology, but at the end of the day, as someone was mentioning, they all, the attacks happen 2 a.m. in the morning, and that time we have the weakest link, the person who doesn't know anything about security, that's the guy who's watching your security. So the guy whose the level is that much, expect what sort of security you have. Um, so you cannot develop a sound, resilient cybersecurity strategy without having a deep understanding. <laughs> My profile, I first hack that I did was 1988. First uh, hardware best virus detection research work, 91. First paper got published in 94. First firewall I wrote was 95. I was part of the Global Enterprise Security Services team, uh, which helped FIA and few other agencies in uh, 80s. I also designed Dubai Internet City, Dubai government, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I also have been the chief technology officer of GHQ for 10 years. And uh, I'm also on the board of a few IT companies, board of banks, a few other. So over here today, my main purpose is to actually explain to you about a project and how we approach the security in that project. Uh, in a neighboring country, in a city, the sheikh of that city decided that he wants to make sure that every person in this city is happy person. To make them happy, they looked at it, what can we do to make them happy? They said, okay, if we can take some of the headaches away from those people or the citizens of that city, which happens to be Dubai, uh, if we take their headaches away, may we make their life easy, they will be happy. So what they did, they created a department, a smart Dubai government, and within the smart Dubai government, they gave them, these were the uh, tasks assigned to them, and this is exactly out of there web page. So that was the purpose. So they said, in order for make to save time and make their life hassle free, we have to make Dubai a smart city. For a smart city, so what they wanted to do was monitor and manage their traffic, monitor power plants, environments, waste management, information systems, libraries, hospitals, etc. So they said, if we monitor all of that, once we collect this data, we can run artificial intelligence. From the artificial intelligence, we will know where the problems are and what we need to do to resolve it. So to, in order to do that from the technology part, you need to integrate information and communication technology. You have to have hundreds and millions of devices. Yusuf Asens have talked about it. And, uh, hundreds of millions of sensors to collect the data, send it back, and then analyze it. My job became to look into it where hundreds and millions of these sensors coming back, how can I secure it? That was my job. And that's what I'm presenting today. Uh, the smart city technologies allow city officials, I can't see it, but whatever it says, that's what it's supposed to do, the smart city technology. So they went on a project, Internet of Things project. There are certain standards which are very important. Uh, there is an IEEE standard, Open Connectivity Foundation standard, and some of the standards from 3GPP, which is a GSMA body, which defines standards for the mobile operators. So the project background was, once they created this entity, Smart Dubai Government, Smart Dubai Government said that any department, including civil aviation, including road and transport authority, which runs all the trains and buses, taxis, 
Dubai municipality, the lights, everything which is automated. In Dubai, you know, uh, I don't know whether you're aware or not, but the, the trains are without drivers. So when a train is moving, it's, or the train overruns or moves out, all of that can be a problem. Imagine civil aviation. In civil aviation, if they are managing all the air traffic, if for any reason something happens, you can imagine the consequences. So job was secure all of that. Then, so what they did, all these departments, they will own a sensor. They will have thousands, hundreds of thousands, or maybe millions of sensors per department. Each department, sorry, uh, 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 each department will send this data to Smart Government, which is a Smart Dubai Government data center. That will be sent back to them using a telecom operator, which in this case was due. Then there will be a cloud infrastructure, very big, large, huge cloud infrastructure, where all of that data is coming. And then there is an application provider and integrator. And this is something in, in IoT world, we use the word terminology called platform. Platform is the place where everything comes and that manages. Uh, the last two lines are saying that the problem with this whole thing is that the sensors are normally dumb devices. But same time, they are becoming intelligent. And as they are becoming intelligent, they are becoming dangerous as well. Because an intelligent device, you can do, you, I mean, the biggest problem is, for us was, that if there is a sensor, someone goes, inserts a cable, changes the firmware, puts something else, and the information is going back to, to them and to the authority. Same time, you can delay things. The way they destroyed the Iranian fuges was they changed their timings. So the timing change destroyed them. Same thing, if you can change certain timing bits with a sensor, you can do a lot of damage to either trains or to uh, uh, aviation traffic. So there are three major components within an IoT infrastructure. My apologies, my, my uh, presentation is a bit technical because I was, uh, there is a platform, there are gateways, there are several different communication mechanisms, then there are devices. If you see that in, inside a house, if you put certain sensors, whether a door sensor or a fridge sensor or an automatic bell, they always go back to a device. That device manages the communication and then there are sensors. And by the way, these days sensors, you can buy it for cents. You can buy a five cent sensor, 40 cent sensors, and they are throw away. And you can even buy a sensor with a very low battery uh, you know, usage, and intelligently they can survive three years, five years, up to 10 years, depending where you are putting. So in my case, I use sensors from five cents to $40,000 sensor, depending on the type of sensor. So going forward, the complexity came for me was that device is owned by one organization. So let's take Diva, Dubai Electricity Water Authority, and Water Authority. Now Diva has automated, you know, um, uh, meters for gas and electricity. Now if there is a meter, meter has to communicate back. It has to give the reading, usage, and uh, quite often when I meet people over here, there are a number of problems in Pakistan which uh, unaccounted for gas is a major problem for SSGC and, S um, and NEPRA have a major problem with the electricity disappearing. So when you have something like this, that cannot happen. So now assume Diva owns that meter. Then each organization to manage their own sensors. So Diva manages it, no one else has access to that sensor. There will be multiple organizations on the IT platform, but that Diva reading is required by smart Dubai government. It might be required for some other reason for another agency within the city or within the country. Now, how do I secure a sensor which is owned by one organization but has to be viewed and available to multiple organizations? I'm going technical difficulty level. Then data or metadata has to be made available to multiple organizations. So that data or metadata means that full data might be required by Diva. 
But part of that data, not 100% of that data, is required by another organization. So when the information is coming, technically, for argument's sake, I don't know what the example I can give, but there's uh, some news comes and, you know, some people need to know, some people shouldn't know. So when it's broadcast, says, how do you control that I'm saying something which is only heard by five people here and the rest should hear different and the five people sitting in the front should hear different. So that was one task. And I have put a lot of technologies there. These are the sort of, uh, whoops. These are the sort of the technologies which I had to look at from communication. The people from communication will look at it that it's extremely complex. Each one of them is a domain of its own. And then we are talking hundreds and millions of devices. So again, when I had to go through it, now I'm going through the solutions. So I have to look at all these protocols. So I had to look at infrastructure protocols, identification. Why? For argument's sake, if there is a sensor and I go and check, or someone, you know, ABC goes and changes the firmware. Now that sensor is doing something different. How do I know that the sensor now has a different code? For argument's sake, your mobile phone. Some of you have a mobile phone, someone changes the firmware and there's a Trojan in there now. You don't know, you will never find out. But there are ways to find out. So communication, whatever communication, there is. discovery. Discovery means you cannot register millions of sensors manually. You can't say that for argument's sake, now I'm deploying 5,000 taxis with cameras and ABC sensor. So each taxi will come and you have to physically go check. There has to be a mechanism where we can take thousands of sensors, register them and securely register them. Data protocols. These are the protocols which actually, uh, we call it buses. These are the buses which run on the network and any information which is required by someone, it drops. It's a big, you know, like it's a uh, DHL that anyone, wherever, but the same information they can give it to 20 different people and they can also pick information from there. So these are those protocols and I can't read rest, but number of, but most importantly <coughs> is this thing, X509. X509 is the cryptography to secure this whole infrastructure we had to have certificate-based cryptography environment in place to look after all these millions of devices and each device to given a certificate and run time and change it as and when required. You know, so that's again, big, big task. Risk identification. So I had to look at all these protocols, had to secure all of them. And same time, uh, again, this is very, the risk factor is amateur hackers, even though the risk factor is high because they're the one who will be trying, but impact is not that high. Petty criminal, cyber, state-sponsored tech. That's always have been my focus, uh, and that's where I work. So my, when I design things, I'm looking at it when there is someone is really state-sponsored, and that's, that's my aim, to secure it against that. So. Uh, So challenges, availability. Every time a sensor connects to the network, it has to be verified. Its firmware has to be verified. Its communication has to be verified. Its certificate has to be given. Encrypted communication has to be started. And if it disconnects and connect, there is a cost, huge cost, the network cost. So the job was to make sure that it is available once it connect. Every time it disconnects, you know there is something wrong. Because for me to put another firmware, I have to disconnect. Someone to hack it, they have to disconnect. Then identity, when it connects to me, how do I find out this is the right device? The person who is saying to me, or the device which is saying to me that I am A, B, C, X, Y, Z of Diva, it is 100% A, B, C, D of Diva. Privacy, the information which is coming back to a central repository, that central repository can be viewed and looked at by all the government departments. How do I control who sees what? 
you know, people talk about authorization level, access level, they are good within an organization. When you are talking at a multi-tenant, multi-level uh, environment, every data element has to be tagged. And every sensor is sending millions of packets, maybe per minute or maybe per hour, depending on the type of sensor. I have to tag each and every packet. Uh, I can't see security. And obviously, all of that is to make it sure that it's secure. Uh, I'll give you another example here. If you look over the right here, there are meters. So for argument's sake, again, if you have electricity meters. Electricity meters, if you start putting chip in, you know, every electricity meter starts communicating back to your data center. And in Karachi, if let's assume there are, I don't know what's the population right now, 20 million. Uh, let's assume 2 million meters are sending information back to your data center. It means 2 million meters have to have a chip and a smart system to communicate and send it back. It means 2 million meters need to have a network. What we do is we create a neighborhood network, NAN. The neighborhood network, the meters are talking with each other and then they decide or the computer, the algorithms decide which meter will send that information back. Now assume my problem that from security aspect, I have to make sure that the NAN works, how do they work, how do they authenticate, what happens you insert a new meter there. I go buy another meter, which is corrupt meter, and put it in there. It's all mathematical game. Then this meter comes back somewhere, and then eventually traditional security where everyone is talking about these firewall security. That's where I put that picture where there was a lamb standing there or a uh, goat was standing there because my belief is People think once they have put firewall, I, I developed firewall in 93. And if someone comes and tells me that, uh, you know, uh, I have done a PhD in, you know, in firewall, I don't accept their PhD. So, fire, and that's where the data is sitting. So the security is not here. Security has to be everywhere, device level. Then you can say whether even the communication is broken. Then even if you say my keys are broken, you can still do because that, that's defense in depth. So some of the requirements, I'll go quickly. They require us to give PFS, which is again to do with cryptography. Uh, they also said that remote disabling of certain features. In other words, they were afraid that in case if a sensor they believe is compromised, they wanted us to disable it. Imagine you can disable an intelligent device. You can disable a Tetra radio. You can disable a PMR. You can disable a computer. You can disable a, a mobile phone. But a sensor is very small, unintelligent device. How do you disable it? The guy who doesn't have intelligence had to play with that as well. So the platform should provide mechanisms to detect anomalies. I mean, that's... Uh, <sighs> If a device can tell or environment can tell that someone is trying to attack me, then we have resolved all the security problems of the world. <laughs> because that is the one of the most difficult. I mean, if, if, if the environment is telling, you don't need anything else. So that was, again, a major requirement given to us. And they wanted us to tell if someone is trying to spoof. Again, which spoofing means that I change the sensor and Sersen says, you know, for argument's sake, if the initial conversation is assalamu alaikum and wa alaikum assalam, it means is that this sensor is saying assalamu alaikum to the IT platform, so the platform should say yes, wa alaikum assalam. No, it can't. It has to know, you know, if I go in as a General Janjwa or somewhere and says I am and I have makeup and everything, there has to be a mechanism to find out whether I am or not. Because in electronic world, you can't see the faces, even though you know who he is. So, again, a uh, lot of technical, I'll just move it. We created a complex matrix whereupon different, you know, uh, criteria. Uh, we created six principles. I'm just going quickly. For each one of them, we had to look at it different aspects. 
We created something called Trusted Computing Base. Not, not created, it is something available. And we sat down with the provider and we sat down with them, we forced them to implement that. This is the one which helps to detect anomalies. Uh, we also went for this another standard which is called Black Cloud, which is actually by DISA and it's a need to know model within the software because the software was developed in a way that it was compartmentalized. So every compartment shouldn't be able to talk with the other compartment within the software, within the same software, not a different application or outside, inside the application should be able to verify, identify that I am this and then it should speak and talk. So we did that as well and what it does is if you look at the bottom, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Look at the bottom, all these attacks were mitigated in this time frame. Uh, another device registration, we had to make sure that every device is registered. There was a process we built. And so certificate base, that was very important because we had to make sure the certificates talk with each other. These were the sensor types. My time is over, I'm moving out. So end of the case study. My philosophy is, my belief is that whatever, whatever I have done, end user doesn't need to work or understand security. That's my belief is. They need to understand. I'm not saying, sorry, please. They don't have to be the expert on security, maybe the right terminology. Job as an IT professional, it should be that I should give them a design or an environment, even if they do a mistake, it should sustain and protect them against that mistake. So they should only have a workspace with their work applications. They shouldn't be given complete laptops, complete desktops. Give them what is required for their job. If they say, I want in the bank, they said, you know, we need this, this, this. Give us in writing, tell us what you need for what purpose. Then there's an approval process. Else, nothing. Give them what they need. If the guy only uses email, Word, and Excel, give them that, those three things. They shouldn't be able to touch, run, anything else. And uh, keep the complexity away from the user, move it to the data center. Thank you very much.